I would like to do in this video a brief survey of the Hebrew scriptures and to point out a chronological development anticipating the birth of Jesus. And I would like to begin <clears throat> and with the, we might say, post-fall <clears throat> before Noah. And that is in Genesis 3.15, what is commonly called the Proto-Evangelium, that is the first gospel by some of the church fathers. It, it tells us that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And many understand that to refer to Satan's kingdom and the kingdom of God through time climaxed by the seed of the woman, that is, being Jesus Christ, who ultimately defeats Satan. The background for that in the New Testament is that the prince of this world, in John 16, Jesus says, has been judged, anticipating the cross. And we know when we look at the book of Revelation, in chapter 12, that Satan is seen as the old serpent fallen, coming down from heaven in judgment. And his final judgment in Revelation 20 at the lake of fire. So that's the first reference. Uh, many believe, many Christians who interpret this around the New Testament, that at this time we're having a prediction of the advent and the birth of Jesus Christ from the seed of the woman, uh, Mary, and through that, ultimately crushing the head of the serpent, uh, referring to Satan. We then move on to the time of Noah, where we are told in that at that time that the Shem, the, the Gentiles, the Jephusites would dwell in the tents of Shem. And what is interesting, as we look at the development of Revelation through the Hebrew Scriptures into the New Testament, coming out of Shem, that is, Abraham and the Jewish race, we see the Messiah and the Gentiles. Those of us who are Gentiles can dwell in the tents of Shem because of what Jesus Christ has done. I'm thinking of the book of Romans, that we are like a wild olive branch grafted in to the cultivated olive tree. Then as we move on in chapter 12, verse 3, we're told in that Abrahamic promise <coughs> that in you all nations of the earth will be blessed. It is interesting when we look at Galatians chapter 3, the interpretation of those words is applied by the Apostle Paul to Jesus Christ, who is the seed in whom all nations are blessed, and they become the spiritual seed of Abraham through faith in him. As we continue then from the patriarchal period there, moving on into the Mosaic period, we have the promise in Deuteronomy chapter 18, that a final prophet would come, who would be the ultimate prophet. And when we look at John 1, that text is applied to Jesus Christ. When John the Baptist is asked, are you the prophet? He says, no, I'm just a voice of one crying in the desert. So we have that anticipation there of the coming eternal prophet. And then, as we continue from the Mosaic period into the period of Joshua, Joshua's name, Yehoshua in Hebrew, means the Lord will save from the root Yasha. It is interesting that Jesus' name is Yeshua uh, in Hebrew, and uh, so we're looking at the Savior. Joshua becoming a type of the Savior. 
who would defeat Satan and uh, sin and bring people into an eternal, can we say, dwelling place with him. Then as we move on to the period of the judges, we begin to see in Ruth, for example, a Moabite who ends up as the great grandmother of David, which is interesting. Already we're beginning to see the promise of Abraham being realized in you. All families of the earth will be blessed. So she ends up in the genealogy of Christ as the great grandmother of David. And we'll see that in Matthew chapter 1, where we have her, we have Rahab and uh, Tamar, and we have then the wife of David, uh, a Hittite, all being in the genealogy of Jesus. And so Ruth, I would say, adds that during what I understand to be the period of the judges. We move then to the kingdom period. And in the kingdom period, we have the great promise during the United Kingdom period given to David by Nathan in 2 Samuel 7. Notice when we read that text, beginning at verse 12, 13, and following, we have the promise that Solomon would build the temple, and yet, coming out of Solomon, there would be kings, but there would be a king who would reign on David's throne forever. So the scepter would not depart then from Judah until Messiah comes. And it is interesting, in this great Davidic covenant, one would reign over the house of David forever on his throne. Uh, we are told it would be established as an eternal throne. And when we look at Matt, or Luke chapter 1, at the announcement of Gabriel to Mary, we are told in that text that he will actually reign over the house of Jacob forever. And so the Davidic promise, the Davidic, can I say, covenant, is then fully realized in Jesus Christ. And his birth is announcing that, or it's being announced by the angel Gabriel. We then move on to the period of the prophetic period, and specifically around 700 BC. And we have the prophet Isaiah. And the very familiar passage in Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. What Ahaz was facing was the invasion of Pekah and Retzin in chapter uh, 7. And the good news that Isaiah is bringing is one who is now a virgin, no doubt will marry and have a son, and before that son knows good from evil, this land would be a devastated land of those that are invading Judah. But that's only at one level. I think the ultimate level of interpretation of that passage, and I would say a double interpretation, is Jesus Christ, who is literally born of a virgin, who literally is Emmanuel, God with us, and who brings about and affects an eternal salvation for those that believe in him. And so that's a beautiful anticipation of the virgin birth. And by the way, the Hebrew Alma is used of virgin in Genesis 24, where we have, uh, for example, a wife being sought for Isaac by Eliezer. And the, the wife-to-be is called an Alma, which at that time would clearly be a virgin. The difference is in Jesus, we have a virgin that never knew a man. It was a divine birth by the Holy Spirit, a biological miracle prophesied as well, I believe, in that double fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. Then we go to Isaiah 9, a beautiful text, we're told that a child is going to be born and his name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
prince of peace, and of his kingdom there would be no end. And that phrase, mighty God, is applied in chapter 10 of Isaiah, very same Hebrew word, El Gibor, is applied to God himself. And so here I believe we have a beautiful picture of the God-man. Jesus will be born, and yet the son that is born is El Gibor and eternal father. Jesus is eternal, and he is the mighty God. What a beautiful prophetic enunciation of the God-man Jesus Christ. And then we move on that he would come out from the root of Jesse in chapter 11 of Isaiah. And of course, Jesus comes from the root of Jesse and from David. And so again, fulfilling that wonderful anticipation. And then as we move on in that same period of time, we come to the book of Micah. I've often called Micah little Isaiah. Uh, he has picture of judgment followed then by that beautiful passage in four and five. And we're told that the birthplace of the Messiah who is eternal would come from Bethlehem of Judea. And that really is what happens when we look at the New Testament. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And then as we continue tracking this in a organic sort of chronological revelatory way, we move on to right before the exile. At the end, uh, let's say we've already gone through the United Kingdom, we've gone through the divided kingdom with Isaiah, we come to the surviving kingdom with Judah, and Jeremiah gives that great prophetic word of a new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34, and in that new covenant, he talks about how the Lord would take away the sins of people. And it's interesting when we come to the New Testament in Luke chapter 22, at the Last Supper, Jesus will say, this is the blood of the new covenant. And when we look at the book of Hebrews, chapters 8, 9, and 10, we see the new covenant fully explained and applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. So then we move from that right before the exile period in Jeremiah to the period of exile, the Babylonian captivity. And during that period of time, from 586 to 536, one of the great prophets was Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 34, it's amazing, he prophesies that one day there will be one shepherd over Israel, and that one shepherd will be Jesus Christ, because it's applied, for example, I believe, in Matthew 1, in the genealogy of Matthew 1, there will be a shepherd that would come forth and shepherd the people, and his name is David, because the, the, the Hebrew name David means 14. It's interesting, we have Aleph, Bey, Gimel, Dalet. Dalet is four, and Vav is six then in Hebrew. So you take four plus six plus four, equaling 14 in the name of David, in what we call a gematria. So it's interesting, in the book of Matthew, chapter one, we have 14 generations from Abraham to David, from David to the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian captivity to Christ. We have a threefold witness of the number 14. I'm convinced that Matthew is clearly saying the final David is here. We also have the great genealogy from Abraham to David, David to the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian captivity to Christ. And we see all of the Gentile women that we had alluded to that are added in to that genealogy, fulfilling the covenant that God, or the promise that God had made with Abraham in chapter 12, verse three. We then move on from the period of exile to the post-exilic period. And it is striking to me that in Hosea, it reads, out of Egypt have I called my son, applied to Israel in Hosea 11, but becoming a type of Christ in Matthew, who is called out of Egypt. 
in a, can we say, a typical, anti-typical fulfillment. And then finally, we have Malachi. And Malachi says that before Messiah would come, Elijah would come to announce the coming of the Messiah. And it is interesting to me, as I think about Matthew 17, that Jesus says Elijah has already come in John the Baptist. And so I think there's a double fulfillment of that Elijah prophecy, not only John the Baptist, but there will be a future Elijah, or however we apply it, literal Elijah, or a type of Elijah, like John the Baptist, that will announce the second advent of Christ. So I'm putting all these texts together in a chronological way in the Hebrew Bible, looking at the preparation of the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. And one of the things we can surely say that he is the eternal King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We need to put a scepter in his hand and a crown on his head.